Andrea, and together with Alexandra, we are going to talk about Firecracker and what we learned from running it in production. So we are quickly going to go through Firecracker design. Okay, this is not working. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> There we go. Now we are going to talk even quicker about firecracker design decisions because we won't have enough time. Um, and then we are going to move to the interesting part of the presentation, which is uh, two of our inglorious bugs. So firecracker is a lightweight virtual machine monitor. It is written in Rust, and it was purpose-built for running multi-tenant workloads in the cloud, like containers and functions. It is currently used in production by AWS Lambda, and it's open source, so you can, have, uh, you can find it on GitHub. Um, the first thing is that Firecracker is a process, and uh, as a security measure, we decided uh, for Firecracker to only manage one micro VM. Firecracker leverages KVM to provide isolation for um, cloud workloads, so that means that it only runs on Linux, uh, and it only supports Linux guests. We currently have support for x86-64, and we uh, started adding experimental ARCH support as well, ARCH-64. So, Firecracker threads. Um, first, Firecracker can be configured via an API server, um, which is implemented uh, with HTTP, and communicates with HTTP clients via uh, Unix domain sockets. Then we have one thread for emulation and other miscellaneous things, which is the VMM thread. And then you can have one or multiple vCPU uh, threads. So since I was talking about the VMM thread, we can look a bit more in depth uh, at this one, because it's the most interesting one, probably. Uh, so Firecracker uh, does emulation uh, using Vert.io, um, and we have block and network. Uh, these are implemented over MMIO. Um, and the block device is uh, backed by a file on the host, while the net device is backed by a tap device on the host. We also have uh, two legacy devices. Uh, there is a serial and a very, very minimal i8042 that basically just supports reset and sending a control alt delete, which is actually the only way that you can know. <laughs> <laughs> you can shut down a VM from... Uh, from outside of the guest. Okay, security boundaries. So um, Firecracker actually comes with a jailer as well, and uh, the jailer does uh, the um, standard isolation of processes, including uh, Sharoot and C groups. And we also have SecComp. So uh, we have SecComp filters that are applied to every threads in Firecracker. So how, what did we achieve with Firecracker so far? Uh, we have a very minimal uh, boot time. Uh, it is around 125 milliseconds uh, now. We also have a low memory overhead, around three megabytes. And this is kind of like by default, uh, the oversubscription of, of host CPU uh, and memory, which is actually because we do not implement uh, any kind of pass-through. And you will see the fine print there, which I hope it's big enough, actually, for everybody to see. Um, these properties are actually dependent on the workload and configuration. So if you want to actually use Firecracker, you will have to test it for your own use case. Now, the interesting part of the presentation. <laughs> um, this is from a book, Turn the Ship Around. And like in the first pages, uh, it says, you are destined to fail. And it really impressed me, and it made me think about some other process that we are using, uh, which is called the COE. So you are destined to fail, and you're most likely going to fail. But what is important, actually, is what do you do when you have failures? And what we do at Amazon and in Firecracker is a process called a correction of errors. And we do this because we want to think long-term versus short-term. So um, we really want to understand what is the root cause of a problem and make sure that we are not making the same mistakes in the future. So to understand this and to actually get to the root cause, we are actually doing the five whys. Um, and we are diving deeper and deeper into the problem. 
Uh, this is also a process that is available for you to check if you want to. And now we can look at the actual bugs. So we have Inglorious Release, which was actually Inglorious Releases. Um, yeah, so Firecracker went a bit mad this time, and uh, the problem was that Firecracker would interminate, inter I can't say that word, sorry. <laughs> uh, it would crash with error code 128. And the problem was like super straightforward. It was just like one syscall that was not whitelisted. But it had a really big impact because of the intermittent failures. Customers were not able to update to the newer Firecracker version. The fix was, again, super straightforward, straightforward uh, just whitelist the syscall. But we had two versions that were actually affected. And to understand why did this happened and what's with the error code and everything, uh, let's first look at how Firecracker handled SecComp. So Firecracker supports three types of SecComp filters. Uh, you can have none, no SecComp, basic, which only checks the uh, syscall number, and then advanced, which, calls, which checks the syscall numbers, but also the parameters uh, used by the syscall. In Firecracker, this is the default. And we are using a whitelist approach, and whenever we have a syscall uh, that is not whitelisted, we are trapping it, updating metrics, such as number of uh, SecComp faults, um, and we log an error which contains the syscall, the faulty syscall, and we exit with that specific uh, error code 128. Now, let's also look at the development. Um, Firecracker is on GitHub. Um, and to uh, merge code into Firecracker, you will have to submit a pull request. Um, then you will have two reviewers that are going to look at your code and the Firecracker CI, which takes around 20 minutes. And if both of these are okay, uh, then we are going to uh, merge the code. Awesome. So for actually having a release, we just tag a uh, GitHub commit and we uh, create a GitHub release. I probably said that earlier, but I don't remember. So AWS Lambda is actually using Firecracker in production. So whenever we have a new release uh, that is available, uh, Lambda picks it up. And now it runs through the Lambda CI. And the Lambda CI, unlike the Firecracker CI, is very, very targeted at their use case. So they are using, uh, in their CI, they are using workloads that are very specific to how they are operating uh, Lambda. If everything is okay, it goes to production, obviously. And then if not, uh, we have a bug report. So for the second issue, it actually en uh, ended up on this path, and we had the bug report. And so because it was impacting, we started to uh, understand the whys. So why wasn't sys m advice whitelisted? Uh, the problem is that for this particular release, uh, we, do, we did two things. So we first added code, which didn't need any syscalls, actually. But we also updated the, fire, uh, the Rust version. And the Rust version uh, had a change in the memory handling, uh, which generated a new syscall. So why did we catch it in Firecracker? Because this was actually uh, not happening all the time. So um, it was a workload-specific syscall, in, uh, which, which was generated by the way that Lambda is using Firecracker. And in Firecracker, we have to make a compromise between how long does the CI take and coverage. So we cannot possibly cover every uh, use case. So. Everything must have been good because we whitelisted, only that it wasn't. So uh, in the middle of the night, we were doing a patch release to fix a patch release to fix a broken release. Um, and the reason is because of a tiny, tiny mistake. So if you notice, like the fix actually is very tiny. Um, the problem is that this syscall was actually only called uh, using the muscle uh, was only triggered with the muscle build. And Rust has this conditional compiling, so we don't want to whitelist the syscalls if they are not used um, on platforms or on different builds. The fix here was like super simple. We just needed to uh, update the target, um, uh, to update the uh, muscle macro configuration. So we had two broken releases, uh, and then we finally fixed it in uh, 0.15.2. And because of this, we actually started to think about corrective actions. Um, so the first thing was uh, we decided to add long-running tests, which are not going to run uh, along with the CI, but was sort of like nightly testing, uh, because it's much easier this way to spot syscalls that are not whitelisted. 
We also started looking at improving uh, SECOM, so we had discussions whether whitelist is actually the good approach, uh, but we didn't really uh, reach a conclusion here. And then, like, uh, the only thing that we wanted to actually merge was the auto-generated uh, SECOMP uh, whitelist. And the problem was that uh, Firecracker uses right now like 30 uh, syscalls, and with the auto-generated SECOMP whitelist is actually 60. So we actually dropped this, um, this whole thing. We are still discussing about improvements because SECOMP is way harder than we initially thought. <laughs> um, and we added uh, the SECOMP improvements to our roadmap for 2020 to keep uh, iterating over it. So what did we learn? We learned that testing is important, so uh, it's very important actually, and uh, it's also very important to test everything that you use, all your dependencies, uh, with the workloads um, that are as close as uh, possible to production use cases. We also learned that uh, we discovered this issue so quickly because we actually have logs and metrics, um, so without metrics we wouldn't have noticed uh, the intermittent failures. So logs and metrics save the day and engineering time. And now I will let Alexandra talk about yet another inglorious bug. Thank you. Hey, everyone. So uh, this isn't actually from a book. It's something that I believe every one of us discovered at some point in time. I did pretty early on. Math is hard. It's hard to do right. It's hard to do, uh, to do it right with equations and everything. And it's also hard to do right in computing because something as simple as an addition can overflow and cause immense pain in production. That being said, this is a success story. Uh, this is about a bug that was discovered and fixed uh, by a member of Firecracker Open Source Community. It was an overflowing integer arithmetic uh, operation, an addition, that was replaced with graceful error handling and didn't lead to any, um, to any pain. But it did lead uh, to, a, to an ongoing effort uh, with the Firecracker team and with our community to harden our code base and improve our overall quality. So yay, successes. And it started with a plus sign. So the problem, uh, like I mentioned, was just an addition, super simple. It was in the memory model crate, uh, which is supposed to read stuff into the guest's memory. The potential impact was if that uh, um, addition were to overflow, either uh, the data could go somewhere undetermined at the guest's memory and cause it to abruptly terminate, or worse, or it could cause the firecracker process to go down and obviously take the guest with it. The fix was trivial, replace the plus sign with a Rust native operation called overflowing add, and uh, we merged that fix in Firecracker 0.12.0, but all versions up to that have been affected. So now let's look a bit into a potential code path for this error to manifest itself. Let's say you have a guest uh, that wants to read something uh, from the, its drive into memory. This program is gonna call read. I could have really used a pointer. Uh, the read is going to go into the guest's value block driver. This is going to trigger an event that eventually makes its way into Firecracker, into the Verlio block device. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, uh, block devices are emulated with files in Firecracker, so what we're going to do is we're going to go uh, and read that information into an intermediary buffer and then pass it on to the memory model crate, which is supposed to put it in the guest's memory. Now, if all goes well, the uh, operation that you see there in red, offset plus count, will not overflow and uh, the, the data will be put somewhere where the guest driver can read it. What about if it does overflow? Well, one of two things can happen. The first is undefined behavior. You don't know where that data goes. And it's, we have reasonable uh, reasons to believe that the guest is eventually going to have to, to suffer from that and to die. Another thing that can happen is the overflow can be caught uh, by the Rust runtime and take down the firecracker process and the guest with it. Now let's dive a bit, a bit deep into that because I put a new word on it, it's called panic. This is a Rust native thing. And let's uh, talk a bit about error handling in Rust. There are two ways you can do that gracefully and un less gracefully. Rust offers a result type, which is kind of an enum. It, it can even be okay with a payload or an error with a payload. And the reason for that is uh, to make it as robust to errors as possible. You can propagate this result from the function that's erroring out and handle it gracefully in the caller. Uh, for this is used for 
problems that you kind of expect, uh, problems that you can see coming, like for instance, when you want to open a file, if it's not there, you're going to return a result and then move it up the frame to wherever you want to handle it. For unexpected problems, like uh, an array being out of bounds, array index being out of bounds, uh, Rust has a panic mechanism. This will eventually lead to the process being terminated in one of two ways. The default one is to unwind the stack of the panicking thread. Uh, this is meant to be uh, a recoverable error because it only takes down one thread and it leaves the user to maybe recover the program and not necessarily die. And the second way is to just raise SIG abort, and unless you have a signal handler for that, which we don't, uh, the program goes down with all of its threads. Firecracker uses the latter. Uh, we don't just let one thread die, we take down the entire process, but just before uh, entering uh, the panic runtime, we install a panic hook. This is also a Rust uh, internal mechanism. It's meant to give you one last chance to run some custom code before terminating the program. What we do is we flush the metrics to get one last snapshot at what Firecracker was doing at the point of failure, and to log an error message, and then uh, let Rust raise SIG abort, and goodbye. So this is the actual problem. Uh, that was the code snippet of where the bug happened, and the highlighted line is where the overflowing operation was. So this is the read to memory function that is called from Vert.io device code, among other things. Uh, usually what happens is uh, the dev Vert.io device is compliant and the Vert.io driver is nice and doesn't send us invalid input, and that operation never overflows. The data always goes into memory where you want it to go, everything works fine. What if, the faulty, or if we have a faulty driver and a non-compliant device, and that operation can overflow? Well, uh, the behavior is dictated, of all things, by the build configuration of Firecracker. So if you're running in debug mode, uh, the Rust runtime is going to detect the overflow and cause a panic. That, as I explained earlier, raises the abort, the whole process dies. But still, it's pretty bad. Uh, Firecracker dies, the guest dies, and it's a semi-controlled mode of uh, termination. But the thing is, we don't ship the debug build in production. We ship the release build. And in release, the, uh, because of the, the optimizations by the Rust runtime, it doesn't detect the overflow and it doesn't panic. And the sta Rust standard dictates that uh, this is undefined behavior. In other words, you don't know where that get data goes into memory and it can go somewhere where you really don't want it to end up and cause, uh, hopefully, the guest to abruptly terminate. And this is worse than firecracker panicking. The solution was absolutely trivial. Uh, the plus sign was uh, replaced with uh, the Rust native overflowing add, which is nice enough to return a Boolean, which marks an, whether an overflow did occur. And on the lines right after that, we turn that Boolean into a result, which we propagate to the caller function and eventually makes its way into a log being printed and an error metric being incremented. And nobody dies anymore and everything is fine. So why didn't we catch this? Seems like an obvious problem now. Why were there no overflows and checks, overflow checks in place where we had integer arithmetic? Well, this is kind of embarrassing, but we didn't actually look at that code a lot. Uh, that particular snippet was unchanged since the revision one of Firecracker. It was a pretty hidden error condition, and we just didn't spot it. Why didn't the CI spot it? Because even, even though in our CI system we do run actual guests, and they do run several workloads, and we test as much as we can, as close to real use cases as we can, their drivers worked fine, and uh, the Vertio devices were compliant, so uh, the overflow never happened because that input was never invalid. A member of the community spotted this and uh, submitted the report along with the fix in a pull request, and uh, we're very grateful for that. And we took immediate action after that to see what we can do to spot these kind of errors before they get a chance to manifest themselves. And we wondered if the Rust compiler didn't catch it, we didn't notice it, maybe a linter would have caught it. Thing is, we didn't have one. Enter Rust Clippy. It's a linter for Rust code. It's also integrated in Rust's uh, cargo ecosystem, build command and toolchain. 
And it turns out that Clippy did have one category of linter errors that caught this operation and others. And at the moment we ran it, when this pull request was submitted, there were over 200 linter warnings pertaining to several linter categories like correctness, restriction, and style, and more. So uh, we figured out that that was kind of a problem and we kick-started an effort uh, in the form of GitHub issues to clean up our code and harden it. We added a test in the Firecracker CI suit that runs Cargo Clippy, treating warnings as errors. So if any of the code looks weird and the linter doesn't like it, the CI will fail and the pull request will not go through. This has allowed us to find and fix some more obscure error conditions before shipping anything to production. Uh, some more overflowing arithmetic, some uh, pointer casts, some non-pointer casts, and uh, several others. We found them, we fixed them, well, most of them at least. We left some uh, cyclomatic complexity warnings there because some functions are just big. And since we were at the episode of hardening our code base, we took another look at all the ways that Firecracker can ab abruptly terminate by calling either unwrap or expect to Rust native functions on result objects. These usually uh, take out the value from an, the okay enum, but if the enum is actually an error, the Rust will panic. We took another look through these and replaced everything that was not a serious program error with error propagation of result objects. We also put Vertio device input fuzzing on our roadmap. This, uh, we didn't have this at the time. We did fuzz our code before uh, open sourcing it and before releasing it first, but it's not integrated with CI. So we're working on adding that support as well. Um, what do we learn? We learned that testing is important. Again, it's a lesson that we just seem to relearn every once in a while. Well, linting is important too because some things are not caught by visual inspection and they're not caught by testing. And they're not caught by the Rust compiler. In the beginning, we asked ourselves if the choice of Rust as a programming language for Firecrack would be enough to ensure smooth sailing into production. And it turned out that it wasn't. Uh, the Rust compiler didn't catch this and the CI didn't catch this, but the linter did. So there are a lot of things that you need to do to make sure that your code is good, good enough for customers. And we're still working, it's an ongoing effort. So to wrap things up, uh, SECOM's hard, math is hard, this industry is hard. And whenever this hardship leads to issues, we revert to this piece of wisdom by Captain Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Says that the problem is not the problem, but your attitude about it. And our attitude about problems when they do show up, because they do, is to understand them, to dive deep, to ask the five whys, just keep asking why some, until we get to the uh, root cause of it, to fix it, and to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> We're good? What, uh, what if any problems uh, did, did SecComp uh, prevent or find? Uh, so the question is, what did any problems did SecComp prevent? Yes. Well, uh, Hypervisor breakouts or what have you. Well, we put it there as a preventive uh, security mechanism. Uh, we are not aware of uh, any problems uh, having showed up uh, that would have been caught by SecComp. But we do, uh, we only whitelist the bare minimum of syscalls and arguments uh, that Firecracker needs uh, to, uh, to run. So dangerous stuff like clone, for instance, are, are blacklisted. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the, it, it's more about, uh, oh, sorry. It's a, uh, it was more about the Firecracker to begin with. So you, you do your vert IO for x86 as MMIO? So I assume you don't do PCI because of, for, for, for performance reasons, right? For speed, because PCI would be slower than MMIO? Or why, why do you do it over MMIO? Well, it was the easiest way for us to get started. That is one of the reasons. It's also uh, performance, but we actually didn't look into how uh, it will play out with PCI. Um, for PCI, we don't want pass-through or anything like that, so MMIO is just 
more like minimal. Hi, um, another sec comp question. Um, so I've, I've hit similar issues in the past and it's always, always a pain and the kind of conclusion that I'm starting to come to is that if you have a dynamically linked binary, you oh. basically can't use sec comp whitelists, especially if it's deployed in an environment that you don't control because those library versions they might call new syscalls and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you already listed, I think on your slides, a few ways to overcome this, whether you're you know, you try to get tools that figure out what the syscalls are. Um, one thing, have you thought about that maybe the configuration file needs to allow um, basically as a short-term workaround when this happens so that you don't need to roll another release, just allow you to add things to the set comp whitelist? I mean, there's obviously a danger in that. Have you thought about that, the pros and cons? We haven't thought about that, but sounds like a reasonable uh, choice. And we will look into that, thank you. And by the way, uh, I forgot to mention that, but Firecracker in production is actually statically linked, so that's why we use Muscle. Any other questions? If no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I need my laptop. <laughs>